Have we opened up? Uh, it's opened up, and um, we have seven at we uh, We'll start when we get a few more people. Okay, great. So what did you all guys do in the garden today? Since we're waiting, <laughs> since we didn't have to water today, right? <laughs> and I'm planting my tomatoes this afternoon. I'm excited. I'm glad I didn't do them the other day because it froze around here. So. Yeah, a lot of tomatoes lost in some larger community gardens. Yeah, the hail was really bad. It's for crazy. A lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay with that. But. I think we're probably ready to go, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Chris, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you everybody for coming today to the question and answers webinar for the eco friendly garden tour for 2022. We're glad that you can spend part of your weekend with us. And so I'm going to do some introductions and then I'm going to show a couple of slides and then we'll just dive right into um, all of your questions and, and get to um, everything that we possibly can. So um, first I'd like to introduce Suzanne Bontempo. Suzanne is, works as an environmental educator teaching the principles of integrated pest management or IPM for sustainable eco-friendly pest management around the home and the garden. Uh, Suzanne has worked as a professional gardener for over 25 years. She's a qualified IPM advocate, for, um, a Rescape California a uh, qualified landscaper, a qualified water efficient landscaper certified, a master composter, and she loves teaching folks about how to grow bountiful gardens that are also safe and healthy for you and your family and the environment. And you can learn more about Suzanne by visiting plantharmony.org. And then also I'd like to introduce Mimi Enright. She's the program manager at the UC Master Gardeners. Nisi completed a sustainable MBA with a concentration in food systems in 2014. She's been with the University of California Cooperative Extension Sonoma County since 2013 and is in a dual role as the Master Gardeners Program Coordinator and Program Manager. Okay, April Owens is a landscape architect. She's been working with California native plants for the past 20 years. She has a degree in landscape architecture as well as an MBA in sustainable enterprise. She co-created the Habitat Corridor pro uh, Project, uh, which is habitatcorridorproject.org in 2019 with author Nancy Bauer, whose mission is to show people how to design beautiful gardens full of biodiversity with native plants. Um, April also owns a landscape design firm, which is aprilowensdesign.com, and April is a member of the Resilient Landscapes Coalition and a board member of the local chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Okay, so then we also have in the background, we've got Cleo Tarazzi, who is a UC Master Gardeners volunteer and retired urban planner who helped the University of California Ag and Natural Resources pioneer defensible space training and Firewise Landscaping in Sonoma County. And she will be helping to facilitate in the background. So you'll hear her chime in periodically to uh, give us an assist. And then we have me, my name is Chris Loomis. I am a senior program specialist um, in water use efficiency for Sonoma Water, representing Sonoma Water and the Sonoma Marine Saving Water Partnership. And I am um, a certified irrigation designer and landscape irrigation auditor through the Irrigation Association and a certified qualified water efficient landscaper, and, uh, which is Quell and a Quell instructor. I've been nerding out on landscape and agricultural irrigation for over 25 years. And I developed a curiosity of urban water about uh, nine years ago. So here we go. Thanks everybody for, um, for coming and hearing us today. So next we're gonna go ahead and just take a look at a couple of slides. And first I'm gonna show you what our current drought conditions are. This is as of May 12th. And some of our viewers today, our participants may have been around for the 1976, 1977 um, drought. That's about what we're feeling right now. I was 
pretty young then, so I'm not sure if I really remember what the repercussions were. Maybe I had a, a more shallow bath instead of a full one back then. I'm not really sure exactly what it was. But um, take a look at, at these reservoir levels. These are at historic, historic lows. And you'll see that, um, you know, so are our rainfall totals. So as you can see here, um, the Lake Sonoma is at 59, or excuse me, 57.9% full right now um, compared to last year. So it's not quite as full as it was last year at the same time, which we know that that was, um, that was already pretty scary. So, um, and then also Lake Mendocino is at 55% where last year it was at 42.5. So we're doing a little bit better off with Lake Mendocino than we were in the previous years. But if you look at 2020, um, for this time of the year, we were at 80% capacity and 87% capacity. So um, if you haven't driven by your local reservoir, um, you might want to take a look. Um, it can, it's, it's a bit shocking, so be ready for it. So I guess the takeaway on this one is that um, sometimes it's good to look at things, the glass is half full, and I'm not quite sure this is one of those times. Um, being that we're in a sustained drought, we can't, we can't continue to, to be sustainable this way. So hopefully we will uh, make some improvements here. And this is the drought monitor. Last year, we had a campaign called the drought is here, save water. And this year we said, well, you know what? The drought is still here. So this is our campaign for this year. And as you can see over here in Sonoma and Marin counties and Napa and, and all around us, Mendocino County, that we are in what you would call a severe drought. And as you can see from these intensity diagrams here, that it, um, it, it either gets worse or gets better from there, but we're in a pretty, uh, pretty bad, bad spot. So we're considered to be a severe drought. And one thing I wanna point out here is in that intensity um, scale there, where you see where it has the white color says that there's no drought in, in particular places of California, you'll see that there are no, no places in California that are not in drought. Every single place in California is at some form of drought at this point. And so that leads us to the next slide. And these are some new things that you, you may or may not be familiar with. And these are water conservation emergency regulations that were brought on recently. Um, things that um, you may not be aware of. So turning off decorative water fountains is a requirement. Um, turn off or pause your irrigation system when it's raining for two days um, after the rain. And that's called um, for measurable rainfall. Measurable rainfall is considered a quarter of an inch. So if it rains a quarter of an inch, you've got to wait at least two days to do any irrigating. Um, use an automatic shutoff nozzle on your water hose. Don't just use your thumb to squirt it. And uh, use a broom, not water, to clean sidewalks and driveways. That includes no power washing. And then avoid overwatering your landscape to prevent runoff. So incidental runoff is where just a little bit of water may um, leave the landscape onto a hardscape. And that's not considered a violation, but if it starts running down the storm drain, that could be a, a stormwater a violation. And then enforcement of the regulations may include warning letters, water use audits, and could lead to fines. So let's just all do our part and, and try to keep that, um, keep the water reined in. And then, so now we've got a uh, couple of polls that we want to post up. We're hoping that people can help us figure out who our audience is today by what you have to tell us here. So first we're gonna do a poll on where are you gardening? So where are you geographically located? So if you could uh, tell us where you're from, that'll kind of tell us a little bit more about um, what we know about you. And also um, how many others there are out there might tell us how many people are locals and how many are not. So it looks like the, uh, so far we've got, um, the majority are in Sonoma County. So it looks like we've got some Sonoma, Marin, and Northern California. So northern, the, the further north we get, we know that um, our water reliability issues may be even worse than they are down into Sonoma and Marin County. So um, let's go ahead and share those results with everybody. And it says it's failing to share. We'll see. Can everybody see the poll? Okay, great. Okay, awesome. Let's go ahead and move on to the next poll. And now what we want to know is, let's see here. Yo, can you do that for me, please? Okay, we've got one more poll. What we want to know is where you are at 
in your eco-friendly garden adventure? Is Are you just getting started? It Was this your shelter in place project? I know that was a big part for me. Um, did you start five years ago before shelter in place? Or are you have you already reached your destination and you're just here to get information? Because if you've already reached your destination, then we're hoping that you're helping others reach theirs as well. Okay, so far it looks like People are just getting started. That's great. Well, this is a perfect place to, to start by joining us today and coming to us with your curiosity because there's nothing better than learning from other people's mistakes. And I don't know about the other panelists, but I've learned so much in my life. Um, and I'm so grateful that I've learned through so many other mistakes, either of my own or through others. And then you pass that information along. So, okay, good. It looks like some people are getting to be seasoned professionals, and we do have one person here that has reached their eco-friendly destination. So congratulations. Um, we would love your help. So I hope that you are reaching out to other fellow uh, community members and, and helping out to help other people reach their destination. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started and see what kind of questions that we have in the Q&A. And let's see here. So one of the questions we have is I looked at all the gardens in the tour, but I did not see anything for shade gardens. My yard is mostly shade and under oaks. What can I do? You know what? I kind of feel like this would be a good one for April since she's got a design called Under the Oaks with the Living Learning Landscape Program. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and um, I, I find that we don't oftentimes have shade gardens as demonstration gardens. So um, a, a great place to start with, with is since you're under the oaks, it's really important to use plants that can be dry in the summer. So you don't want to water the plants, um, water under the oaks during the summer months much. So that's really a big concern. Um, and think about the plant communities that would be under the oaks. Um, and you could also use the redwood plant community, but outside of, from under that oak. So things like wild roses and native roses and native iris and um what are some other great ones even rivies that that nini talked about would be gorgeous in an oak woodland kind of garden um and it, this is my plug for the living learning landscapes that the uh, the sonoma water and you see master gardeners and the habitat quarter project put together um along this the santa rosa jc so we have a website called living learning landscapes Calm. And um, there's free plans on there for eight different gardens. One of them is under an oak garden. So there's a great list of plants there for you to peruse. And you can go visit the gardens and see what, where they're at and, and even come out to some of our maintenance days to learn more about them. And can I add a few things on, on what April said? So um, Joan, phenomenal question. Um, and uh, April really covered the basics. But wanted to highlight that um, so uh, each of us uh, did a short video to accompany this Q&A session, which you'll, you'll find on the Eco-Friendly Garden Tour site. And I talk about a couple options you can think about for use under oaks. So as April said, um, you know, our oaks have evolved as have all of our plants here in our summer dry climate to no summer water. So you for sure you wanna pick plants that once you've got them established, which for native plants usually takes about two years, that you can stop irrigating them during the summer months. So there's a wonderful um, salvia ground cover called salvia spathacee, and I talk about that, have some pictures um, in, in my pre-recorded video. Um, wonderful, stays low, uh, gets these great spikes of kind of a rosy pinky red flower. Um, this time of year, I can look out the window <laughs> from where I am and I, I can see mine blooming. And as April mentioned, there's also some really wonderful ribes. Um, under my oak, uh, a ribes I don't ever irrigate uh, is ribes speciosum or fuchsia flowered ribes, uh, gooseberry, and I also feature that in the video. So you can look out for that. It gets a little taller, so it's it's not a ground cover. Um, and then there's another ribes called ribes viburnifolium um, that stays maybe about two to three feet high. So lots of really wonderful native options that have really good application um, under an oak tree. And Cleo put um, a link. So on the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County website, we have a really wonderful California Natives landing page with more information. 
um, and we've got information on, on what you want to do for planting under oaks. And then we also have a series of plant lists that you can access. Um, and, and you should be able to find one for dry shade on there as well. So hopefully that helps with a few starters. And all of those beautiful plants are at the Living Learning Landscapes too. So you can really see them in action. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much for that great question. So meanwhile, off in the chat box, we've got some action for you. So Cleo has put in a link for planting under oaks. And I put in a link to the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership plant picker where you can um, take a look at some plants and pick plants that are that's, uh, fit your specific needs. And also, since we're talking about the living learning landscapes um, under the Oaks plan, I went ahead and put a link to that right. um, landscape plan for those. So a um, couple of things, I wanna go back. Um, I see something in the chat um, from Mark Coughlin, and he mentions that we should also be comparing the, the drought of 1976 and 77 and mentioning that how large our population has grown since then. So there's more people trying to use the same resources that we've had before. And so that's a really great point. The good news is, is that if you think about um, a, a toilet or a washing machine from 1976 or 1977, we've really made some progress in those areas. So it's quite surprising um, but the, but the gallons per capita per day, so per person per day, has gone down so significantly because of those improvements that we have been able to keep it up. Um, now, um, we have such efficient indoor fixtures that it's a little bit harder to make those adjustments indoors to save water. So it's really got to go outside. That's where we can save the most water is outdoors. So um, it looks like um, Cleo has brought up the plant picker page. And I know there's one on the Master Gardeners as well. And this is a pretty new page. It's dynamic. So we are adding things to it all the time. You can um, filter it out and look for specific plants. But these are all plants that grow really great here. And then I know that there was a question about um, Santa Clara. So um, you may want to look into um, what's called the water use classification of landscape species. And I'm going to spell it slow here, um, the acronym. It's W-U-C-O-L-S, Wolkholz. And that's a great place to find plants that will, that will thrive in your geographic area in California. So you can go here, you can tell it what city you live in, what kind of plants you're looking for. And there's lots of great pictures here. So hopefully people that are from out of the area, but still in California, you can use this resource and find some awesome plants. And, and Kim, Chris, I would just add on top of that, um, I, I think all the plants that April and I mentioned would work just fine in Santa okay, Clara County. I grew up in Santa Clara County, actually. Yeah. But also, I would point you to, um, for sure, to the UC Master Gardener Program of Santa Clara County website. Um, I haven't looked in it, it, their specific website, but I'm sure that they've got plant recommendations uh, appropriate for Santa Clara County there as well. Great. And I put it in the link. There's also calscape.org, which focuses on native plants and has kind of a, not as um, broad as the plant picker, but it has a way to filter out plants and know what is native to your area as well. So you can kind of pick from that. It's a, it's a resource. phenomenal resource. You can key in your zip code. Yeah. Uh, and it pulls up. Wow, it's funny even to learn like what's in your neighborhood and what is that plant native. You know, it's it's a good yeah. resource. Great. Yeah, it's a phenomenal resource. Thank you, Cleo, for bringing this up. So you see that um, there's plenty of resources out there, and a lot of times, like you might see a plant that you really like that's really pretty, and then you find out that it's a water hog. Um, a lot of times, what you can do is go, okay, I really liked how that plant looked. What else can I find that looks just as good that doesn't take as much water? And these are really great. Uh, resources to be able to find that. Um, so I also Chris, wanted to- in terms of nerding around, I mean, you could nerd around on these websites for hours because right. there's such, especially if you're just beginning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you're going to get really excited. And a lot of these have places where like you can make a shopping list mm -hmm. um, and you can just kind of, and then print it out and take it to your local nursery and, and go from there. So um, I do wanna encourage people to use the, the, the Q&A. If you're not familiar where it is, it's at the bottom of your screen. 
and click in there and just type in a question for us and we will try to get all of your questions answered. And if we can't get them all, you can also, you can go to the contact us on the savingwaterpartnership.org website um, if you think of a question later and then we can direct it to the, the right person and, and answer those questions at another time. Um, let's see if we have anything in the, the Q&A right now. Where is the best place to purchase these native plants? Okay, so Joan wants to know where's the best place. Joan, do you, can you tell us a little bit more about in the Q&A, can you type in there where you're from? But we can probably get started with Sonoma County. Um, let's ask uh, one of the, I'm sure you guys are itching to answer. So anyone, <laughs> yeah. all of us can answer this one. Uh, like, uh, yeah. Jones and Healdsburg. So I will say, um, uh, you should be able to go to any nursery and say, here's the plant I'm looking for. Can you buy it for me? Um, so if you've done your research on, you know, you've, you've gone to some of these website resources we've talked about, um, and you found what you think is the perfect plant application for, for your situation. Um, uh, you can always go ask any, any local nursery, if, you know, if they'll order that for you. I will say we're really, really lucky here in Sonoma County, very close to you, Joan, um, to have a, a nursery, a native plant nursery that is um, mostly native, probably 98% native plants called Calflora Nursery on off Fulton Boulevard and just the loveliest people and any questions you have, if you go in with what you're looking for and what your situation is, um, they would be more than happy to make a recommendation for you. Um, there's also, you know, you're, you're starting to see a lot more resource, uh, uh, native resources, native plants available in other resources. Annie's Annuals in the East Bay, also a phenomenal website if you're looking to learn more about plants, um, has a really amazing native selection um, and, and really great descriptives. So, and, and there's uh, April, what other native nurseries am I? Well, not? I'm associated with our local chapter of the California Native Plant Society, and we have an amazing sale in the fall. I think it's the second October, second week in October. And, um, you can on the cmps.org, you can find out about the, the plant sales. And that's another great resource for you all from all over the state, the CMPS, um, um, different um, memberships, different areas, chapters have wonderful plant sales with volunteers and you can find all kinds of fun rare plants that are not typically in the nurseries as well. So that's another great resource. I think there's a mostly natives. I haven't been there yet out in Point Reyes. There's mm -hmm. a, a new, newish, mostly natives. Used to be um, in and, Wallace. And, then and I, I, I always ask, I, I suggest that you go in and ask for natives at your local nursery because nurseries just don't understand how important it is that you are actually wanting them. So if you can go in and say, I wish you had more nurseries I and mean, more native plants, it would be so helpful to all of us that are really looking for them. Absolutely. And I just want to piggyback off of a comment that April made, which is um, why does CNPS have their plant sale in the fall? And that's because uh, the best time to plant native plants, well, really, frankly, the best plant time to plant any plants for us in, um, in our summer dry climate is in the fall when our rainfalls, hopefully, are coming, fall and winter period, so that they can get established over that wet period, right, have less of an irrigation demand requirement for it as compared to if you plant it now, you're in June or July, you know, in some of our hottest periods with some of the highest water requirements for keeping a plant thriving and, and happy, you're gonna to have to really apply a lot of supplemental <laughs> irrigation um, to, to get it through the summer. So um, CNPS uh, you know, is, is timing the plant sale perfectly for when the best time to plant the plants is. And that's, as native plants, they've adapted to grow most of their root structure during that time period um, as an adaptation to our summer dry climate. I think even Chris, you might know more about this. I think, think some municipalities right now aren't allowing planting. I think Healdsburg and, or has that kicked in yet in Petaluma? No, actually Healdsburg is, um, they, they've changed that, but, but, but that's a, that brings up a really good point, April. Before I go there uh, really quick, I did want to say that in the, in the chat box, I put a link to the partnerships uh, list of water smart plant nurseries. So you can click on that link, go there and find out nurseries that have the water smart plant label and um, look for plants that, um, that are drought tolerant there. But um, so- 
I put the, the link to a new partnership in the state of California between CMPS and California Native Nurseries. And this site is called Bloom California. And they have a nursery locator that has all the native plant nurseries right. in California. Awesome. And I, I, right. I didn't know about that one. Yeah, it's actually, they have good, um, in, good information. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so um, that brings up a good point. So last year, what, you know, the Sonoma Marine Saving Water Partnership, we're a partnership of 13 utilities all the way from Cloverdale down to Marin County, where we collaborate our marketing and ideas and, and try to just all share so we can make our efforts go as, as broad and wide as possible. And so last year we had conversations about, um, first, we, we want people to convert their turf to more ecologically friendly landscapes, low water use landscapes, things that create habitat, um, build the soil. And, but part of the problem was that most of our turf conversion rebate programs were requiring people to, um, re to replace their turf with a new landscape very quickly within 120 days. So what I believe all of our partners did last year was we extended that time frame that, okay, you can go ahead, we'll inspect it and say, yes, you do have turf that's living right now. And yes, you're eligible for a rebate and then encourage you to not actually plant it at all for a while. Let's just wait until at least, you know, fall came around. And um, because we don't want people, you know, replacing their, their turf and then putting a new landscape that now they have to irrigate all season when there is a drought. So it's encouraging people to go ahead and prepare it, get it ready for drip irrigation instead of sprinklers, but actually don't plan it for a while. So if you're considering doing a turf um, in a replacement, that's something to ask your, your utility if, if they're offering that, because that would really stretch our water resources a little bit farther. Chris, uh, somebody, uh, Gertrude had her hand up. If she has a question, can she put it in the Q&A or in the chat? She, I, the hand was lowered. <laughs> okay, and Julie has a question in the, uh, in the chat box. I'm wondering, uh, Cleo, if you can give her the link to just the, uh, the tour also. And then okay. also Julie is mentioning that she has carapia and that it's wonderful. We would love to have some more images and, and be creepy and do drive-bys of people's houses, just to be honest, because we all want to see it, right? We all want to see what does it look like right now? What does it look like later? What does it look like if you never mow it? What does it look like after you've mowed it? Just to kind of get an idea, because generally, you know, they say you don't have to mow it, but it's more like vacuuming your lawn a little bit, maybe. Uh, with Carapia, it would be um, great to see that. And UC Davis has done a really great uh, study on that. And it uses quite a bit less water. So I'm super excited about that. And uh, so Julie, yes, we do want some pictures. And I live in Healdsburg. We all live fairly close somewhere in Sonoma and Marin County. So we would love for you to share those with us. So you can do the contact us th through the partnership page and we can talk that way. So that's awesome. Okay, so let me get to the and Chris. Can I? I'm just going to call out on the on the Q and A. Um, actually, April at Owens and my colleague uh, on the Resilient Landscapes Coalition, which is um, we do educational outreach on firewise and sustainable uh, defensible space, um, included a couple more nursery resources. Um, Jail Industries, uh, which is down at, uh, near the Santa Rosa Airport. Um, they have a new director of the program who has extensive background in, in uh, native propagation. And she's really trying to highlight more natives at the Jail Industries Nursery. So thanks so much for highlighting that one, Ellie. And she also highlighted the Sonoma Ecology Center Nursery. Um, so thanks for sharing those, Ellie, that was great. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with the jail industries, it's like a diamond in the rough, really. It's kind of like a secret little hidden place that you can pretend no one else knows about but you. So it's really cool. Um, they do a lot of great work there. So, um, And the yeah. prices are amazing. <laughs> yes, they really are. It's like, I, I could still spend a lot, right? You're like, I'm still going to spend a lot. I'm just going to get more for my money there. So that's great. Okay, so let's see. Do we have any... Um, Cleo, do you have any questions off your favorites list that was kind of brought in earlier that we might want to 
Um, well, I wanted to uh, get, let Suzanne talk to us a little bit about soils. Um, I mean, a lot of people here are just beginning. And uh, can you let people know about the importance of soil and how to prepare your soil? And we could also ask afterwards the other folks to add about uh, native plants and soil. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, well, um, soil should not be an afterthought. It is really important. The more time and energy and effort you put into preparing your garden, adding compost, amending it, um, maybe doing some sheet mulching where it's layering cardboard uh, overlapped with uh, no less than three inches of wood chips, maybe in an area that's kind of crummy or, you know, an area of the property that you will get to later. Uh, when you are ready to plant, that process has made that soil super active and uh, workable and really easy to dig into. But the point is, it's like getting some type of organic matter into the soil is always going to um just be so incredibly beneficial uh i know that there are some misunderstandings about native plants maybe not needing to be fertilized or amended but understand the native plant that you're purchasing from a nursery has been grown in a specific uh growing medium their own soil that that plant is used to and now we're bringing it home to our garden which is a different soil um, medium and maybe we have really great soil maybe the top soils have been kind of robbed because it's a, a new development it's hard to say but it's always nice to just get some compost into that soil to amend at time of planting and or top dress uh, the root zones of your plants with some compost, even if they, you know, once they have been planted and are becoming established. The reason why is because not only is compost loaded with um, so much beneficial bacteria and fungi, it is also going to uh, help your root systems grow and expand, which is what we really want, because when we have healthy root zones that can grow wide and deep, uh, then they are able to access water and we'll need to water less frequently. Uh, also something to consider is that when we're able to amend our soils with some compost or get some organic matter into that soil, uh, compost can hold five times its weight in water. So right now, um, uh, aside from all the other amazing benefits compost can do for your soil and for uh, your growing healthy plants, it's also going to save us a lot of water. So those are the, I guess that's the one, um, those are the main points about soil. Soil should not be an afterthought. Could you tell us more about, um, about sheet mulching? Like what is that process? Could sheet mulching is the process of laying down cardboard and you're going to overlap those edges at least six inches so that no sunlight can get through and, uh, access that soil. We want to cover that soil completely. And then we're going to put no less than three inches of, of chips on top of that. And these can just be bark chips. It could be uh, chips from a tree that recently got chipped from an arborist. It can even be an inch of compost, two inches of chips, whatever the recipe is. Um, you can just do three inches of compost if you want. That would be a little bit expensive, um, but uh, you know, layers of cardboard on top of each other overlapped with no less than three inches of chips on top on an area that's super crummy or an area that's glorious or an area that you just are tired of weeding or mowing. You don't even have to remove those weeds. You don't even have to remove that lawn or that mow zone. You just put that cardboard right on top. Sometimes I'll just step on the weeds if they're kind of tall, just to lay them down. And I put the cardboard there and then I put the few inches of mulch. And then I do need to water that area in. I do need to saturate that area just to activate that uh, biology. Then after that, you can just forget about it. And then, you know, 12, 18 months from now, you're going to have this gorgeous planting zone that will be virtually weed free and ready for you to expand your gorgeous native garden. It's pretty magical, I have to say. It's it's really it's classically used for lawn removal when you don't want to have to um, cut out the lawn and um, you can sheet mulch your lawn and, and it just decomposes into this really beautiful soil matter that this Suzanne was talking about. I sheet mulched a small garden bed that was really weedy uh, and that what I was first wanting to plant into. And I've, I've 
that never very rarely have any weed issues um, in that bed from having done that initial sheet mulching before I then went in and, and, and implanted. So it's a really great, easy, low cost way to uh, reduce your maintenance and get rid of your lawn if you're ready. Yeah, to and to stuff. regenerate the soil. I've also sheet mulched around older fruit trees that look like they're kind of on their last leg, maybe been neglected for years from uh, previous you know, residents. Uh, and sheet mulching just around that drip line of the fruit trees, boy, let me tell you, they come back with vigor. So it is a really wonderful, very inexpensive practice that can really uh, supercharge your garden. Chris, another question that we get often is in the face of the current drought conditions, what should you prioritize in your garden for watering? Well, that one for me is very easy. Uh, trees, number one, absolutely, you need to save your trees. Um, they will pay you back tenfold, and they already probably have. So if you've got to, you know, choose between having green grass in your front yard or, or, having, a, or having a tree, for sure you should pick the tree first. There's a hundred reasons, but one of them is just um, and there's different reasons that affect people in different ways. One is the emotional attachment to their landscape. Some of it is the monetary attachment to their landscape. So there's a little bit of both. One is you have to look at it as um, what is the cost to replace your landscape? How much would it cost to replace a tree? And when you talk about replacing a tree, you have to consider actually removing that tree also. And what are the hazards that are, that tree is going to cause if you do let it die? Um, now it's become a severe fire hazard as well. Um, if you let your lawn die and you are just absolutely wanting it back someday, you're $20 away from some seed to sprinkling it around and putting it back. And that's much easier. And hopefully you would decide on putting something else in its place, but absolutely positively, it should be trees, number one. And if you don't feel like you have the irrigation water to do it, then figure out a way to divert your laundry water to your trees. Figure out a way to bucket your, your warm-up water out to your trees. Do whatever you can to keep them alive. Another question we have is, are dyed wood chips, wood chip mulches safe to use? The dyed wood chip mulches are dyed with a food-based, vegetable-based dye, so they're safe, they're not toxic. However, a couple things to keep in mind is that those dyes will uh, bleed out, they'll leach. So if you're uh, using them around a porous patio or concrete that might absorb that dye, that can be an issue. Um, I would be really bummed out if I put out some, you know, dyed red mulch and then that kind of, you know, stained my um, walkway. So just be mindful of that. Uh, something else to keep in mind is that the um, dark, the, the, the wood chips that are dyed dark colors, like the dark brown or black, they actually retain a lot of heat uh, and will keep those root zones uh, hot or very warm into the evening hours, which is uh, ideal maybe for coastal gardens or, you know, like San Francisco area um, or the other side of Marin where you maybe want to capture that heat in the root zones if you're trying to grow, you know, your tomatoes or something. However, in most of the other areas of California, we don't want to hold on to that heat. That heat would be too stressful for the root zones and it would actually um, prevent the plants from really growing well and would add a lot of stress. Great. Um, a question that I think a number of the panelists can answer is adding mulch a fire hazard. And can you give some details of how to mulch in light of our uh, wildfire conditions here? Well, I know Mimi, you've dealt with this. <laughs> so um, April and I, and one of their participants uh, in, the, in the group today, Ellie Inslee, um, came together uh, about three years ago now, I think it's been, to form the Resilient Landscapes Coalition. And um, uh, our focus is on helping educate the community on what they should be doing in their defensible space and how that can be resilient or sustainable. Um, and mulch is a, a hot topic. Um, so there are three zones in the zero to 100 foot defensible space zone around structures. The first is called zone zero, which is the zero to five foot perimeter around any of your structures. And scientific research does support that you use no organic matter 
in that zone. Um, so embers are the highest contributor to structure ignition during a wildfire. We know from very painful experience here in Sonoma County that the high winds can cast, do ember casts, you know, miles in advance of a fire front. Um, so preparing your home in defense against embers is a really critical part in our wildfire preparedness. Um, and anything organic in that zero to five foot zone can ignite, whether it's, it's a foundation shrub, uh, an old woody shrub or wood mulch. Uh, and then that can then um, transmit the fire. Uh, if that organic matter in that zero to five foot zone then catches on fire, it can transmit the fire to the home, to the structure. Next, you move out to zone one, which is five to 30 feet. And um, the recommendation is to have islands of planting, which you would have mulched, of course, right? We all know that how important mulch is from, um, we, we talked about weed management and water management and it, it cools the soil. It, it, it provides a lot of really, really critical functions um, in helping um, maintain our gardens effectively. But you wanna have your islands of planting, your mulched islands of planting separated by hardscape. So a brick pathway or gravel or a decomposed granite or uh, anything to break up that flow of fire through that organic matter of the mulch and the plant materials, again, uh, in close proximity to the home. Um, the recommendation is to keep your mulch layer at about two to three inches thick. Um, and you want to choose larger sized um, uh, bark mulch. Uh, and then in the 30 to 100 foot zone, uh, zone two of the defensible space, same kind of principles of islands of planting mulched, islands of planting separated by some hardscape to break up the flow of fire to the home. What have I left out, April? Oh, and no gorilla mulch. Absolutely no gorilla mulch. And not mulch. all mulches are equal yes. is really the, the lesson here. And even, even that, di that question of the dyed mulch, does that add to the soil? Is that contributing? We oftentimes use composted arbor mulch is really the, the right term for the mulch that, that is most fire wise. And Susan, you could probably, Suzanne, speak to this, but that really adds to the, to the soil. I feel like the arbor mulch actually makes the soil better versus cedar mulches or other mulches just sit on top and don't do anything. 100%. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for Chris, since you're our irrigation guru here. Um, really, can you tell us how much water does turf grass use versus low water use pl plants? It can't that be is, that bad. Uh, <laughs> no, it is. It's bad. I'm not going to lie. So um, let me just lay it out for you. If you were to have turf grass in this geographic area, and I'm talking about Sonoma and Marin counties, and um, say like Ukiah, it's even higher. So per square foot, so you think about a 12 inch by 12 inch square of turf grass uses about 37 and a half gallons per season to look its best. That's a pretty high number. When you think about what does 37 and a half gallons look like? And you go, okay, so that's over seven five gallon buckets stacked on top of each other. That's how much water it takes for that given space in one year. So that's a lot. Versus a low water use landscape or native landscape only needs not even quite eight gallons per square for the first couple of years. And then after that, it goes down to zero to two and a half gallons per square once it's established and if there's normal rainfall. So if you want to find out, you know, whether your plants are high, moderate, or low, you can go to what I mentioned earlier, which was the water use classification of landscape species and find out how much water your plants are using, whether they're low, medium, or high, and they have designations for that. So you really want to try to stay at the low and very low range so that you can make the best use of the water that you're going to use. And we have that link in our resources page too. Since I have you here, <laughs> uh, how do I know how long to water? I've always done it the same way, but I'm not, uh, but I'm not, if I, I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, irrigation scheduling can be tough, right? It can be um, really easy to overwater and not even know that you're doing it because if it looks good, you think that you're right on target, but often you gave it more than you actually needed to give it. So um, landscape controllers are helpful, but should never be a set it and forget it type of equipment. 
The best choice is to install a smart controller that automatically adjusts to the changes in the weather. So when it's warmer outside, it irrigates more. When the season changes and it starts cooling off, then it um, automatically lowers the number of minutes that are run. And that's just to kind of give you a helping hand because people don't tend to go out to their garage and reset their controllers very often. So if you don't know how to do that, you're afraid to touch your irrigation controller, you should hire a professional to help you. If you don't know where to find one, you could start with the Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper Program um, at quell.net, which is a WaterSense certified program, um, EPA WaterSense. Um, if you want to do it yourself but need a little bit of help, you can try out the irrigation scheduling tool on the Sonoma Marin Saving Water, um, Saving Marin Saving Water Partnership website. And there is also a link for that. And it's called the irrigation scheduling tool. And it's, it's something to give you a baseline of how maybe you can be um, setting up your irrigation controller. And then I know um, City of Santa Rosa um, had that wonderful program that I thought got extended to all municipalities in Sonoma County last year, where you can sign up or go to a web page in your mu municipal area, mm -hmm. and during the sub summer months, get recommendations based on weather station data for how long you need to be irrigating certain types of right. Yeah, it's very landscapes. similar. That's the the Santa, city of Santa Rosa's water smart page. I'll try to get a link uh, put up for that, but that's a good point. If you live in the city of Santa Rosa, they have very similar um, data as we have on our on our irrigation scheduling tool. Um, but yeah, they, they've been at it for quite a while. Yeah, and it just makes it so foolproof that, you know, based if you have a low water use garden, you know, mostly native, low water right. use Mediterranean, mm -hmm. this many minutes on this drip system, Perfect. or there if you go. do have a lawn, cool. this many. I mean, it's just, it makes it really foolproof. Right. A couple of things I'd like to add though, is that, these are the water schedules are amazing and they're a really wonderful tool for us, especially those of us that aren't as familiar with um, how to water our plants or how water moves through our gardens. But I just like to say as a side note that these are um, starting points that um, this is um, the reason why it's so difficult to uh, teach people how often or share how often they should be watering their garden is because it depends. It depends on so many factors. Um, and a couple of things I just want to share is that uh, you should understand your plant material and how much water that plant material needs once it's established. Something else to consider is how long, I mean, are, is this a new planting? Uh, because a new planting is going to require different water requirements than something that is established. Um, hopefully you've uh, installed your plants with similar water needs grouped together. So they're hydrozoned. Um, something else to keep in mind is how um, are you, are you in, in an area that gets that four o'clock wind that just tunnels through your garden or, you know, note how the sun moves across the property or if there's any hot pockets or if there's a grade where water seems to pool in one area, but it always stays dry in another. These are all things to really keep in mind. And as a, another side note, it's really important to understand that as your plants grow, so do the roots. So move that irrigation, those emitters out and add more emitters just so you can always make sure you're getting a nice, even nice deep watering to water the root zones of those plants. We're not watering at the crown or the base of the plant where the stems and the roots um, meet. I just wanted to add that because it seems that these are questions that I get all the time and I get photographs from a lot of the people I work with if they've joined one of my programs showing me and landscaper just installed this and the, there's one emitter and it's right at the crown and it was buried like four inches with mulch. This is exactly the opposite of what you said in your program. So just know that, um, just get out there and look and observe and get curious and just see what's going on. And then if you've got questions, this is an amazing panel of experts that can absolutely help you. So don't, uh, you know, be shy or, you know, or feel nervous about it. Just get out there, get curious. Maybe it's perfect and that's what you want to hear. And maybe it needs a little adjustment. Well, and I have to say there's no substitution for observation. Um, yeah. And Suzanne made reference to that. And if you are like we all need to be doing, trying to cut back on, you know, what's the minimum amount of irrigation I need to sustain my landscape during this really water scarce time, there's no better thing to do than to go out and observe is something drooping? Is it demonstrating that it's looking water stressed? And I, I will say that some things will droop 
in the hot, hot heat of a one, some of our late summer afternoon um, uh, high temperature days and, and recover just fine. So mm -hmm. some might be heat specific, but if, you know, there are certain um, indicators you can look for that, that show a plant is, is under more stress and, and needs some supplemental watering. But, um, you know, the, the set it and forget it that Chris talked about earlier is absolutely what we should not be doing, and especially in this kind of water crisis. And that's kind of another plug for native plants yeah. and local, like learning about what's local, because like when we went and visited Mimi's landscape and where she lives in hot um, Geyserville, Geyserville, right? Cloverdale. Cloverdale. Even you know, hotter. Even hotter. <laughs> um, you know, there's manzanitas, there's plants that, that some native plants can survive without water in the summer at, at all, you know, or go off irrigation completely. And some plants that are more coastal are going to need a little more water. So if you know about your, your plant community as well and kind of lean on plant communities that, that need less water, like chaparral, oak woodland, then you can you can turn it off. But I always I worry when people say that did it, you know, a couple of years of water and then turning off irrigation to native plants if they're not used to that or they're used to the coastal influence and fogs and they're not going to make it. So well, and especially, so we're getting such variability in our rainfall now. Um, you know, if we haven't had a wet winter, mm -hmm. then, you know, for your native plants, you do need to be supplementally irrigating if we're not getting any rain during the winter to mimic what the normal cycle would have been, had been historically that they've evolved in. Um, so it's, it's, it's a real kind of mind shift as well. If, if we're experiencing the, and, the and Suzanne of mentioned the hydrozoning, but you can also, Chris, I'm sure you do this. Like we, if we have a chaparral plants and then we have that, that don't need water after two years, and then we have some plants that are going to need to stay on irrigation, we put a valve on so we can shut that off to that, mm -hmm. the, all those plants, like all those manzanitas are on the same, um, not even on the valve, but on the, what do you call that, Chris? Like a little, the irrigation line. Yeah, well, no, the, where you could put a clamper on some of the irrigation. Right, right. Turn it off. Right. In, in the sure, side. you can put it just an inline valve. Yeah. You can back up or you can snip it off. And that's it. that brings up a good point is like when you go to install like a drip irrigation system is kind of just scanning the yard and going, okay, what, what are the opportunities later? These guys won't need water at all at some point, And these will. Then you make sure that you plumb it in a way that you can shut some off and not the others. Um, one other thing I want to bring up is that um, if you have some plants in your yard that are more needy than other plants, but they're on the same irrigation system, so they're running for the same amount of time and, and one plant is just a little thirstier than the rest, is to try to resist just running the whole zone longer. It's better to either you know, to address the individual plants by giving them a little splash to kind of hold them through or investigate why they're not happy and the other ones are. So perhaps they need another emitter to be put on so that they can be happy. And I've, I've had that experience in my yard where I have a plant in the hydrozone that really doesn't belong there. It's a little meatier than the other plants and trying to figure out how to make it happy without drowning everybody else can be a challenge. But I, I made a point of figuring out how to give one plant a little bit more to keep them happy instead of overwatering all of them. Uh, Chris, I wanted to clarify a couple of questions that people have asked. Um, sure. Some people thought that this was a live tour of the Echo Gardens, but it's an online tour and all the garden, all the tours are available online. And you can also see on there uh, video recordings of presentations by Mimi, by uh, uh, April, and by um, also Corey from the uh, uh, Daily Act. So and Suzanne, <laughs> Suzanne, Suzanne. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, make sure you go to that link that I uh, I, I dropped on the in the chat, so you could mm -hmm. find exactly uh, the. Right. And they're all on YouTube as well. I, I wanted to do a really quick question uh, that people, if just answer it really quickly, all of you, okay. If you're just starting and you were in an elevator with someone and they tell you, I wanna start a drought tolerant, uh, friendly, eco-friendly garden, what do I do right now? Go, Chris. <laughs> oh gosh, on the spot, okay. I wanna start a garden so they don't already have one. They don't have anything. Okay, then I would have to say, um, look around and if you have any turf, 
and you never stand on that turf for any other reason other than to mow it, that's where you start, right there. Just take it out. <laughs> Turf has zero support for our insect and, and animal populations. It offers no valuable services other than a playing surface or mm -hmm. somewhere for your dog to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and that's 37 so, uh, and a half I'll go gallons. Next. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Chris. I was just saying, and that's 37 and a half gallons per square of water you'd be saving per season by, by replacing that turf with something else. Okay, Suzanne, what would you do? Oh my goodness. Um, okay, so if it's a bare area, I would uh, I would start by just sheet mulching. I would sheet mulch that whole area. It'll give me a lot of time to plan and to uh, go through. I wanna start with larger uh, plants first, uh, depending on the size of the property. I might wanna start with a tree or two to create shade and to anchor. And then um, from there, I might be scouting garden centers just to see what looks, or the scouting the neighborhoods to see what looks really nice, what's cool, what do I want to add? And then from there, always the right plant in the right place. Really understand the maximum size of that plant. We do not want to be pruning those plants all the time because again, that adds stress. Stress plants get bugs, they get pests that we don't want. So right plant, right place, and sheet mulch. All or right. sheet mulch and then right plant replace. <laughs> Mimi, since uh, Suzanne took one of our basics. Ah, I would <laughs> say <laughs> set yourself up for success and map out your irrigation system. Know what your water use plants that you're selecting are. Have a design in mind. Know what the water use of the plants you're selecting are and, and set up your irrigation system first. And you're uh, a long way on the road to success. And I, I'm going to leave the big plum to, to April for what her recommendation would be, which of course I hope is going to be about the plants. <laughs> I was going to say, I've been doing, I, I, on, on the Habitat Corridor project, we have a little newsletter we send out if, if once a month. And yesterday I wrote about um, a habitat meditation. So I would recommend going out and getting like once you've done all those things, the irrigation and the mulch, like everybody talked about, go buy three of some, go to the Calflora, go to a native plant nursery, buy three of something that appeals to you and observe it. And, you know, and you could even plant it for, you know, next couple of weeks, then you'll have three plants that you could nurture over the summer and get to know. And it kind of gives you an insight into what, what lands on the plants and how delightful these natives are besides being beautiful. Then you get the bumblebees and the butterflies and everybody that comes to them. So that's what I would recommend. Do you want me to give you mine, which I did? Yes. Is yes. get patience. <laughs> Lots of patience. Yeah, forget all those TV shows where they come in and they plop these gardens in 10 minutes. You have to get to know your space. Uh, to get the right plant in the right place. You'll make mistakes, you'll experiment, you'll figure out the watering, but it's it takes uh, three to five years to really, don't you think, to establish a really um, garden and also a lot of research and a lot of reading and ask questions on how people, um, how they nurture their plants. Great, thank you. So okay, can, we, can we do a shameless plug and, and point people to the videos that we've pre recorded? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we. Um, I, I, I have the. Um, uh, hold on a second, and I will do that. I uh, put all the videos in the uh, document that uh, we're sharing, the PDF. Uh, let me share that PDF one more time so that. It, and all the videos are there. It, they're excellent videos. Each one of the speakers here spent uh, uh, half an hour to tw 20 minutes uh, going into all these areas in detail. Uh, Chris, do you, did I miss something? And I also, um, one of my, my design gardens, a resilient garden is in the tour as, a, as one of the representative gardens too. And they did a really nice job of walking you through the gardens. I really recommend taking the time and, and watching the videos for the gardens too. Right, so there was a comment in the chat box that the link took them to the 2021 uh, tour, and that could be so, that the tour didn't actually launch until this morning at 10 a.m. So the link that would have been up there would have been from last year. So we've done this tour virtually a couple of years now. It, normally it was done in person. Um, I know people really loved to go out and do it in person, and so did we. But um, 
So we've taken some of our favorite gardens that have different uh, sustainable elements and have put them into individual um, videos. And we're hoping that you can get some inspiration by looking at each one of those videos where you might not be able to get all, to all the, the gardens you would have liked if we were in person. So we don't know after uh, this year what next year will look like. I'm kind of hoping we have a hybrid. I'm hoping that we, we have some options for people that just don't have the means to get out and about or and um, want to take a look at some really inspirational gardens. Um, and then also for people who want to get out there and smell the flowers that can get out and enjoy it. So hopefully we'll have both. Um, I want to thank everybody for showing up today. This has been really fun for me. And um, it's so great to just hang out with, with fellow nerds on uh, subjects that they're passionate about, really. And thank you, Cleo, for putting this all together and everybody that showed up today. We hope that uh, you'll visit the partnership page and cruise around and, and visit it often. So thanks again for coming. I Everybody. put the Google uh, Drive link. Uh, it's a, uh, and then we're going to mail you that link as a follow up to everyone who attended. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cleo, for staying on top of that. So if you uh, have any other questions, you can reach out to the contact us page on the savingwaterpartnership.org page, and we will get back to you. All right, everybody have a great day. Bye, Thank, you. Thank you. Bye-bye.